Jack London was arguably America's first celebrity author. His life, though short, was one of adventure and often controversy. He was a poacher, a failed gold miner, worked in a canary, spun jute, and rode the rails as a hobo, all before reaching the age of 18. He became a world-famous writer and outspoken advocate for animal rights, workers' rights, eugenics, socialism, and atheism. Isms, in my opinion, are not good. His work as a writer made him fabulously rich, and he flaunted his wealth shamelessly. A lifelong, unashamed love of drinking led to his admitted addiction to alcohol and a frank discussion of alcoholism in his memoir novel, John Barleycorn. London wrote to the titular character a euphemism for whiskey. He gives clear vision and muddy dreams. He is the enemy of life and the teacher of wisdom beyond life's wisdom. In his book, he gave a new term to the English lexicon describing the drunkard whom, stupid with drink, falls frequently in the gutter and who sees in the extremity of his ecstasy blue mice and pink elephants. Seeing pink elephants has been a metaphor for drunkenness ever since. London's work was marked with a realism the reader often sensed and the writer had often experienced. His most evil character, the sadistic sea captain Wolf Larsen in The Sea Witch, was based on a seafarer he had known in his youth. The Yukon characters of White Fang and The Call of the Wild were based on people he knew during his own adventures in the North. Though he exuded a hale and hearty appearance, his health was often frail and he was subject to several illnesses, most of them aggravated by his chronic drinking. He rose from rags to riches, though he never lost sight of the rags. Welcome to Biographics. I'm your host, Eric Malachite, cosmic horror author and production manager behind the scenes here. Today's script was written by Larry Holsworth. If they've provided their socials, go give them a follow as they'll be linked alongside my own. With that said, go ahead and like, subscribe, comment down below, and get ready to learn about Jack London, The Call of Survival. <laughs> Jack London was born John Griffith Cheney in San Francisco on January 12, 1876. His father, a ne'er-do-well astrologer named William Cheney, had demanded his quote-unquote wife, Flora Wellman, sources differ whether they were legally married, abort the child when she announced her pregnancy the preceding June. When she refused, he refused to accept responsibility for fathering the child, leading her to attempt suicide by shooting herself. Relatively uninjured, but institutionalized for mental derangement, she gave birth to her son and immediately surrendered him to foster care in the form of a free black wet nurse named Virginia Prentice. Young Jack would not learn of the circumstances of his birth and the identity of his father until many years later. He knew little of his father, the scandalous circumstances surrounding his birth, or his mother's background until many years later. His nurse served as his surrogate mother and supervised his daily life. At the age of 12, Jack London began his career by taking work at Hickmott's Canary, where he labored packing pickled asparagus into jars for 10 cents per hour. In his off-work hours, he read books he obtained from the Oakland Public Library, where an interested librarian guided his selection of reading materials. He favored a waterfront watering hole known as Heinhold's First and Last Chance Saloon. Then he encountered several characters who would later appear in fictionalized form in his works. From various characters who patronized the saloon, situated on Oakland's then-notorious waterfront, Jack learned of the profits to be made from poaching oysters, which teemed in the bay. He purchased a small schooner named the Razzle Dazzle from another oyster pirate, and in short time made more money than could be had from months of asparagus packing. He sold the illegally obtained oysters to Heinholds and other waterfront establishments. Razzle Dazzle was in disrepair and before long proved unseaworthy. London then obtained employment with the California Fish Patrol, tasked with the ironic duty of preventing oyster poaching in San Francisco Bay. His next career move was signing on Sophie Sutherland, a seal hunting vessel which took him on his first voyage overseas. On board the sealer, London traveled to Japan in 1893. He was 16 years old when he left, and upon his return, he found a country in the depths of a severe financial panic. After taking low-paying jobs, including one in a jute factory, which offered grueling work and little money, he took to the railroads, hopping trains at random and living in hobo camps. During that sojourn, he was arrested for vagrancy in Buffalo, New York, and spent 30 days in the Erie County Penitentiary. Of that stay, he later wrote of the unprintable horrors of the Erie County Pen, 
I say unprintable, and in justice I must also say undescribable. They were unthinkable to me until I saw them. Released, he returned to Oakland, completed high school, and submitted several stories to the Oakland High School magazine, The Aegis. One story gave an account of his experience at sea, describing a typhoon encountered off the course of Japan. In 1896, he entered the University of California, Berkeley, funded by John Heinhold, his former customer during his brief tenure as an oyster pirate. While at Berkeley, he read the newspaper's accounts of his mother's attempted suicide and the minor scandal it had generated, and wrote his biological father, who had by then moved to Chicago. Cheney replied, denying his paternity, accused Jack's mother of promiscuity and slander, and claimed he was the true victim rather than either the mother or son. Devastated, Jack withdrew from Berkeley after receiving the letter. He did not complete a degree at Berkeley, nor did he submit any writings to the university's newspaper. In 1897, the lure of gold strikes in the Yukon proved too distracting to ignore, the promise of adventure and quick riches bearing more weight than classroom studies. In July 1897, he went to the Yukon, accompanied by his brother-in-law. He was then 21 years of age and until then had enjoyed robust health. Jack London became one of what is an estimated 100,000 prospectors who surged into the Yukon during the Klondike Gold Rush of 1896 through 98. Reaching the Alaskan Territory required traversing sections of Canada, and by 1897, Canadian authorities required incoming would-be miners to bring with them food sufficient to sustain them for an entire year. Despite the caution, most miners found themselves destitute, starving, and consequently in ill health. Jack London found himself in this category. London developed scurvy, which caused the loss of several teeth. He complained of pains in his back and upper legs, developed sores which left permanent scars on his body, and suffered from debilitating weakness. Eventually, he was forced to accept shelter in Dawson, where, though he had food, there was little in the way of medical care. He did not find gold which was the case for most of his fellow participants in the gold rush, though some did become fabulously wealthy. He did find the tales that became the basis for some of his earliest stories, including some of his most famous, such as To Build a Fire. That short story described a man lost in a winter storm and of his gradual freezing to death. London wrote two versions of the story, published the first in 1902, and a second expanded version in 1908. Both are based on the theme of a man against nature. In 1898, in ill health and battered by his Yukon experiences, London returned to Oakland. He had personally observed the disparities between the wealthy and the less fortunate, including the fact that those arriving in the Yukon already financially well off had a greater chance of successfully mining gold than those hoping to get rich quickly. The Klondike Gold Rush strengthened the socialist leanings London had already developed, formed in hobo camps at sea in jail and in his own reading and studying. Those leanings became a feature of his work in his writing career. In the 1890s, magazines enjoyed a boom in sales, driven by improvements in printing which facilitated publication at lower costs. Jack London began his writing career just as this boom was taking hold, when there existed a large market for short stories. He concentrated on that genre, drawing upon his experiences at sea in the Yukon and in the hobo camps that he had once inhabited. To most Americans, Alaska represented what was then the final frontier. Remote and possessed of a harsh climate, dangerous wildlife, and equally dangerous men, tales of Alaskan adventures caught the fancy of the reading public just as Jack London launched his literary career. Magazine publishers offered substantial payments for new fiction for their publications, and London's short stories found a ready market. His earliest stories used the Klondike as their setting, peopled with characters based on those London had known. By 1900, he was making sufficient money from writing that he was comfortably middle class, and his career as a writer had just begun. That year, London married his first wife, Elizabeth May Mattern. They had been longtime friends prior to the marriage, sharing a passion for photography. Eventually, they had two daughters together, but the marriage was often strained. Jack complained to friends that every time I come back after being away from home for a night, she won't let me be in the same room as her if she can help it. He spent many nights away from home in bars and brothels. By 1903, the marriage was so strained that Jack moved out of the family home, and the following year, they arrived upon a divorce settlement. 
Though his marriage was strained, his success as a writer continued, along with a public image of London as a hale, hearty outdoorsman. During the years of his first marriage, London produced what is arguably his most enduring and famous story, The Call of the Wild. London sold the story to the Sunday Evening Post in the early months of 1903, and the novelization rights to Macmillan at the same time. Macmillan launched an expensive publicity campaign, and the novel sold well. As with many of London's works, the story revisits themes he explored in similar tales, including the short story Diable, published in 1902. In that story, a vicious owner so badly torments his dog, the animal retaliates, killing the man. London posited that human treatment shapes animal behavior, an opinion frequently attacked by his critics. London did not restrict himself to short stories, nor to stories set in the Yukon. He followed the success of The Call of the Wild with another novel, The Sea Wolf. Set for publication in 1904, the entire 40,000 copy first printing sold out through advance orders before the novel was released. London had by then achieved international fame, significant wealth, and a devoted fan base for his short stories and longer works. He had also become an outspoken socialist and an active member of the Socialist Party. In 1904, William Randolph Hearst tasked Jack London to travel to Japan to serve as a war correspondent for Hearst's newspapers during the Rousseau-Japanese War. During a brief stay in Japan and Korea, he was twice arrested by Japanese authorities for entering restricted areas without permission. London asked Hearst to allow him to transfer to the Russian side, where he believed he would have a less restricted view of the front. He was promptly arrested a third time by the Japanese, who accused him of assaulting his aides. It required the personal intervention of President Theodore Roosevelt, who was not a London fan, to gain his release, and he returned to the United States in June 1904. <laughs> Jack London chose to set the bulk of his tales in harsh conditions. The freezing Yukon, violent stormy seas, rough lawless mining camps. He then made them harsher still, with lost or injured men facing the elements, wild animals, psychotic ship captains, and other enemies. In one of his early short stories, Love of Life, 1905, London described a lost, injured, and steadily weakening gold prospector, both stalking and being stalked by a wolf. Neither can find anything to eat. Finally, the exhausted prospector is prone on the ground when the wolf approaches, gently licking the man's hand to determine if his prey has the strength to resist. When it becomes evident the man can't, the wolf sinks its teeth into his hand. London describes the will and the acts necessary to survive, both by the man and by the wolf, with equal compassion and without expressing which is more worthy of survival. Simply put, both are driven by a desire to live, despite the harshness of the frozen landscape in which the story takes place. It is a theme expressed in many of his stories, as is the interactions between animals and man, especially dogs and wolves and the men who exploit them, hunt them, and fear them. Another repeated theme in his works is grinding poverty, a condition he knew well before the success of his writing career. He ennobles the poor in many of his works, while vilifying the wealthy which kept them, in his view, in their impoverished condition. The poor can always be depended on. They never turn away the hungry. He wrote in Confession a tale of daily life as experienced by hobos. To London, the poor and the traveling vagrants, then known as hobos, were, like all forms of life, faced with the law of survival of the fittest, and merely struggling to survive in a world every bit as harsh as the howling wilderness of his tales. Jack London was an avowed atheist throughout his life denying any possibility of a supreme being or an existence in some form of afterlife. I believe that with my death I am just as much obliterated as the last mosquito you and I squashed, he wrote. He subscribed to social Darwinism, which places human beings under the same laws of natural selection as plants and animals, but also this same theory placed significant emphasis on the inequality of the races. It was essentially scientific racism, and not to be confused with actual Darwinism or the theory of evolution at all. London's racism remains evident in much of his writings. In some cases, it is reflected in the societal norms of the day, while in others, it is far deeper. He supported the fear of Asian immigration, which was common in the early 20th century, subscribing to the racist beliefs of what was called the Yellow Peril. 
In a 1910s short story, The Unparalleled Invasion, London predicted an Earth of the Future, 1976-86, to where China has colonized much of Asia and the Pacific Basin. Its expansion in land and population leads to an invasion by Western nations, including the use of germ warfare to stop the Chinese. London, like any author, has had his supporters who deny his race's proclivities. They cite his treatment of Mexicans, Japanese, Inuit, Polynesian, and other peoples as evidence that London did not harbor racist tendencies. He was especially admiring of the Japanese, evidence in his work as a war correspondent in Japan during the Russo-Japanese War. London was a fan of boxing, and an amateur boxer himself. When Jack Johnson became the first black heavyweight champion in 1908, London was appalled. It was London who coined the term Great White Hope as he called for a white professional to step forward and defeat Johnson. The white man must be rescued, he wrote in a call to boxer James Jeffries to fight for the title. Jeffries responded by coming out of retirement to face Johnson and was soundly beaten for his efforts. London was also a supporter of eugenics the quote-unquote science of selective breeding and sterilization of undesirables. I believe the future belongs to eugenics, he once wrote. Later in his life, while living in Hawaii, his views altered when he observed intermarrying between Hawaiians and other races. Several short stories express his views on the subject, which altered considerably over the years. In The Valley of the Moon, 1913, London presents real Americans, in quotes, as being descended from the Anglo-Saxons. Subsequently, in My Hawaiian Aloha, 1916, he observed successful interracial marriages in Hawaii, is making a better demonstration than the United States. In 1905, Jack London married his second wife, Charmian Kitteridge, the niece of his editor at the San Francisco-based Overland Monthly. Their marriage was a happy one, and the once noted philanderer became more of a homebody. The couple was inseparable. That same year, London purchased a ranch in Sonoma County, California, which he named Beauty Ranch. He invested heavily in the ranch, which he intended to be a real working ranch, operating at a profit. Instead, it was a financial failure. He also spent lavishly on a 15,000 square foot ranch house, which burnt to the ground just weeks before the couple was to move in. London had named the structure Wolf House after his own nickname, given him by friends shortly after the publication of The Sea Wolf. He was determined to rebuild in efforts to begin cutting and seasoning logs for its walls, built upon stone foundations, began after he obtained an insurance settlement. It was not to be. The ruins of Wolf House are today a National Historic Landmark, part of Jack London State Historic Park. London spent too much time away from the ranch to provide adequate close supervision of its operation. About six months of every year were spent traveling, often to Hawaii in his later years. Charmian was his constant companion on his travels, though the couple tried to have children, they were unsuccessful. One pregnancy ended in a miscarriage, another child was stillborn. Together they sailed in his yacht Snark across the Pacific to Australia, and had numerous voyages to Hawaii. Upon their returns to the United States, they stayed at Beauty Ranch. Next to my wife, the ranch is the dearest thing in the world to me, Jack wrote. He continued to produce short stories, nonfiction articles, and novels, though he readily admitted his sole purpose for this work was the wealth it produced. I write a book for no other reason than to add three or four hundred acres to my magnificent estate, he confessed. The couple occupied a small cottage on the ranch when in residence. In December 1915, Jack and Charmian departed for what proved to be their last visit together to Hawaii. By then, Jack suffered from the effects of his chronic alcoholism, though he did not make any effort to quit drinking. He also suffered from the effects of numerous illnesses, including kidney failure, malaria, and a tropical infection of the skin and bones known as yaws. Despite his various illnesses and complaints, he maintained a full social calendar in Hawaii, no doubt to the detriment of his declining health. London returned to his ranch in California in July 1916, where his health continued to deteriorate. As was common at the time, he relied on the over-the-counter drug morphine to control his pain. By late summer, he was also suffering from dysentery, uremia, and the continuing ill effects of his alcoholism. He died on November 22, 1916. Officially, his cause of death was listed as uremia and renal colic, both diseases of the kidneys. Immediately following his death, rumors of his committing suicide began and continued to this day. 
The rumors were bolstered by the frequent references to suicides in London's writing, including his report of his own attempted suicide described in John Barleycorn. Though it is possible an anecdotal morphine overdose contributed to London's demise, the generally accepted cause of death remains uremia. No evidence of a suicide has yet been unearthed. London was cremated and buried at Beauty Ranch, near the ruins of Wolf House. Charmian survived him until 1955. Upon her death, she too was cremated and her ashes buried alongside his. Jack London is remembered chiefly as an adventure writer, though he was much more. He wrote adventure tales, of course, but he also wrote mysteries, psychological thrillers, science fiction stories, history romantic novels, and at least three semi-autobiographical confessionals. He was, at various times in his short life, a pirate, a hobo, a vagrant, a gold prospector, a sailor, a seal hunter, a war correspondent, and a political pariah. He was an early and strident advocate for animal rights, particularly for those held in captivity in circuses, menageries, and zoos. And he opposed women's suffrage because, as he wrote in John Barleycorn, he feared women getting the vote would lead to prohibition. Wow. His eyewitness account of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, published that year in Collier's Magazine, remains a popular first-hand account among researchers into that calamitous event. His novels have been popular sources for films and television. The Sea Wolf has been filmed in not less than 10 English-language productions, as well as in both German and Russian. The Call of the Wild has proven similarly popular. Jack London wrote more than 20 novels, more than two dozen nonfiction articles and essays, and over 200 short stories over the course of his short life. Today, he is remembered chiefly for one, The Call of the Wild. Once the highest paid writer in America, he is relegated to the classic literature shelves often ignored by modern readers. Yet many still devour his tales of struggle and survival swept up in the eternal battle between man and nature, so well described by the man who not only wrote it, but lived it. Well, I certainly hope you found this video to be informative and entertaining, and if so, be sure to do all that algorithmic jazz and keep it tuned here for more interesting biographies. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.